Welcome, welcome, welcome. Now, I don't usually do English Monarchs on this channel, and it hasn't really been a conscious decision, but maybe there is some deep-down genetic hardwiring that doesn't allow me to talk positively about the enemy. Sorry, I, I mean neighbour. But today we're talking about Henry V of England and the arrow that shot him in the face. So yes, yes, I know what you're thinking. Typical Scott only able to talk about an English king when he's been shot in the face with an arrow. And you're right, it does seem that way, but I assure you the story of the medieval surgery involved in this one is worth discussing regardless of any personal persuasion or bias. So let's begin. Henry V of England. <coughs> Sorry, my apologies. It really can't be helped. I don't even mean to do it. It's sort of like when Andy Murray wins and he's British, only to be Scottish again when he loses. It's just something we do without thinking about it. I know you don't mean it, and neither do I really, so let's continue. Henry V was born in 1386 and would die in 1422. He was the son of, surprise surprise, Henry IV of England and Mary de Bowen, who, fun fact, was the great 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 niece of Henry de Bowen, who Robert the Bruce, bat at the Battle of Bannockburn, caused quite a headache for, by splitting his skull in half with an axe. Damn it, I've done it again. I'm sorry. I am sorry. It really can't be helped. It's ingrained in us from an early age. It's like how we all have to rise and get out our woad war paint whenever we hear someone scream. <laughs> but again, I digress. Around the age of 16 or so, Prince Henry at this point was called to the Battle of Shrewsbury. The Battle of Shrewsbury was fought in 1403 between Henry IV of England and Henry Percy and his Northumbrian rebel army. The Percys had previously supported Henry IV in his war against his brother Richard II for the English throne. Along with conflicts in Wales and Scotland, Henry IV had offered land, titles and sums of money to those who had continued to support him. But when the war was over, and in the case of Percy in particular, he handed over the promised land to a rival, and the payment never materialised. So naturally, rebellion. The date is July 21st, 1403, and just shy of 30,000 men set up around the battlefield. Sources differ, but it is generally agreed Henry Percy had around 14,000 troops, whilst Henry IV had somewhere between 16,000 and 60,000. Yes, history is fun that way, no sources ever seem to agree, however, it is agreed Henry IV had a slightly larger army, although Henry Percy displayed a level of confidence and arrogance in a meeting he held with the king just prior to the battle. His display suggests, in Percy's mind at least, that this battle was winnable, and therefore we are taking the lower estimate of 16,000 troops to be the size of King Henry IV's army. In the early hours, just before dusk, King Henry raises his sword to begin the attack. The battle begins with an immense volley of arrow fire, and just for the record, these were no average bowmen. Henry Percy's army held the legendary Cheshire Bowmen, who would become famous for their victories at Cressy and later in Agincourt. Many men were killed before getting within range to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Henry IV's right flank began to flee after its commander, the 5th Earl of Stafford, was killed by infamous Scotsman Archibald Douglas, the 4th Earl of Douglas. Archibald Douglas, the 4th Earl of Douglas, was one of the suspects in the murder of David Stuart, the Duke of Rothesay. It was this murder that allowed for James Stuart, or James I of Scotland, to come to the throne. But yeah, we've been over that elsewhere, so let's continue. It is said it may have been more than just the right flank that began to flee, as by the end of the battle, the King's supply wagons were being looted by Cheshire rebels, who allegedly made away with 7,000 horses. At some point during the battle, the future Henry V of England was hit in the face with an arrow whilst leading the left flank. Now I suspect, given that these Cheshire bowmen used longbows that would rip through a person if it contacted cleanly, that Henry V actually sustained a ricochet or glancing wound to the face. Probably whilst his visor was open so he could direct orders or see better whatever. I say this as knights were armoured up and anything other than a completely clean hit at the perfect angle would most likely deflect off. I hypothesise, given that the arrow didn't fire itself all the way through his face, that maybe some of the impact was absorbed elsewhere. Maybe glancing off a nearby soldier's shoulder's plate, or perhaps even his own breastplate before rebounding it and ending up inside his unprotected skull. Perhaps seeing the prince fall and the king's right flank begin to flee, 
Henry Percy took the opportunity to engage the king directly. Henry Percy led the charge aimed at killing the king, during which his royal standard was overthrown and its bearer, Sir Walter Blount, was hacked down by Archibald Douglas. Yup, that guy again. As discussed in the Stuart series, the Douglases probably deserved their own series after the Stuarts, as they were fierce warlords, devastating on the field of battle, and they were sort of like the ginger equivalent of Karn the Betrayer, except they weren't ginger, and I hope you didn't fall for that lazy stereotype that all Scottish people are ginger, you filthy bigots. But I digress. During this charge, allegedly as he opened his visor to dictate battle, he too was struck in the face by an arrow. Although unlike the prince, this arrow, from the weaker set of archers I might remind you, had no problem at all ripping through his face and rendering him redundant from his position among the living. The battle ended soon thereafter, and it is noted that despite winning, the king seemed to have taken more losses than that of the rebels. What would come next sounds absolutely horrific if you happen to be the prince. So first off, even if it was a glancing blow, for most people this kind of blow was death. Fuck, getting a splinter was sometimes death, so this was a particularly accelerated way to leave the living. Luckily, this was the future heir to the English throne, so he got some badass treatment by his day's standards. Although not a fun ride, it would be a better ride than his now deceased rival, Henry Percy, who tried the same trick, but fucked it up completely. Now, when you've got an arrow stuck in your face and it needs to come out back in the medieval era, the best way of doing that was to just smash that sucker through the other side and hope it doesn't damage anything on its way. Which is hilarious, that's not medicine, that's getting a kill assist for the enemy. If I ever come to you with a blade stuck in my chest, please don't think the best way for you to act is to continue pushing it through my body until it completes its journey to the other side along with me whilst you're at it. This applies especially so if we're talking about an object that's stuck in my head. The fuck? No. That said, the alternative is also bordering on insanity and involves inventing a device for this specific purpose, which sounds better in theory, but wait. So enter John Bradmore, an English surgeon and metal worker, and no no, don't fool yourself into thinking these are contradictory occupations, not in the medieval era, they complement each other perfectly, back in the day when you could just make up medical instruments to sell to random people without pesky licensing and all that good stuff. Back in the day, when if you needed some midwifery, you just go down to the fishmonger and hope for the best. With that said, John Bradmore is in an interesting position at the time of Henry's impending facial reconstruction, as he was in prison for making counterfeit coins. But his reputation was good enough that Henry tried to eat an arrow like Kirk. Oh, fuck it. But his reputation was good enough that when Henry tried to eat an arrow like Kurt Cobain cleaning his shotgun, John Bradmore was called from prison in to help save the prince. At some point during all of this, Henry V's new Pinocchio impersonation had fallen through as the shaft connecting the arrow to the arrow head had snapped in his face. Wonderful. But good old Johnny Boy decides, given the shaft is now snapped, that he will need to keep the wound open until they can create a device in order to recover the arrow head. So they get some sticks, wrap them in some linen on the ends, cover them in honey and just jam the sucker straight into the gaping facial wound. The honey is antibacterial, so there is some logic to this, but I bet you this sensation was akin to what I can only imagine losing a tampon up inside yourself must feel like. So, we have honey in the hole, now we just need to design and create this instrument to get inside the face and recover the arrowhead. They designed this two-threaded tong-like device which held a central tong in the middle. This would then be inserted into the prince's new face vagina and the central tong would act like a corkscrew whilst the threaded tongs would allow the wound to stay wide enough for the central tong to be screwed into the arrowhead currently resting inside the skull. Once all connected, it can all be dragged out back through said face vagina, but let's bear in mind this is 1403, nothing is clean, there is nothing sanitary about this process. So, for the next couple of days, either John Bradmore or a blacksmith working to his specifications built the device, and it was finally ready to use. A quick slice to reopen the now healing wound before we force this homemade piece of metal we made deep into your skull. After the operation term used loosely, the freshly opened wound was drowned in wine, because nothing, and I mean nothing, do I want more than to be poured into my freshly opened face. It's some medieval homemade wine with bits of grape flesh, 
seed, and probably the fucking stem, getting up inside that wound. Lovely. But amazingly, it worked. The prince would survive, although his face would be a car crash from then on absolutely fucking up any royal portrait and probably the unfortunate painter tasked with painting it. For his service, John Bradmore was released from prison and given a state pension. He also did follow-up medicine work for the king, and at some point between 1403 and his death in 1412, he wrote the Philomena, which documented his newly invented device. Which, as it turns out, happens to be one of the oldest written treatises we have on surgery. In addition to this, as an attendant to the king, Henry IV, Bradmore was assigned to oversee the care of William Winslow, the king's pavilioneer who attempted to commit suicide by stabbing himself in the stomach. Which isn't some sarcastic reference to him being impaled by a tent pole or something. Guy went straight up harakiri on himself and aimed for the stomach. Unfortunately for him, medieval medical marvel John Bradmore was on hand. Despite having ruptured his intestines from the stab wound, Bradmore would tend to Winslow for 86 days and he would survive. Which probably pissed off Winslow no end, especially if he was wanted for a crime or some other horrific reason and that was why he chose to take his own life. But anyway, there you go. Some English history for you. You got John Bradmore and Scotland's favourite arrow. Sorry, I mean the medieval medical miracle that was removing an arrow from Henry V's face 